Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We want to welcome those who are joining us online right now for this special celebration, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Happy Resurrection Sunday and to some happy Easter Sunday. Glory to God. Our message today, Jesus, the substitute for you. Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. That's love. That's love. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. He hung his head. For me, he died. That's love. That's love. That's not how the story ends. Three days later, he rose again. That's love. Hallelujah. Oh, what love he has for me that he will give his life, that he will give his life. That's Oh What's Love by Vicki Winans. Amen. We sing this song on Resurrection Day as a summary of what the Lord Jesus has done for us. Over 200 years ago, I imagine the Jerusalem Witness News reported the most heinous crime that has ever taken place on earth, which became or becomes real to us every Resurrection Sunday. Some might say we experience heinous crimes in America every day in the land of the free and the land of the brave. No doubt they are heinous, but the difference is that they did not involve the Son of God, Jesus. Jesus, who died and raised and, and rose on the third day, is seen walking around Jerusalem. Ain't that interesting? His story should be on an episode of one of those crime shows or podcasts. His story. Since they will not cover it, I will read the reports for you. The first part of solving any crime is the investigation into why someone would do such a thing. Did this person have any enemies? Did Jesus have any enemies? This brings us to what the prophet named Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 53 verses 3 to 9. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 to 9. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he was born, he born our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the inequities of all of us, of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shares is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. That was 
the story told of what happened to our Jesus, the heinous crime. Why would someone want to do this to him? The second part of any good investigation is to interview witnesses. Apparently, there were many witnesses, but one in particular came with a great account is as to why this was done. Let's read the Apostle Peter's statement in Acts 2, 22 to 23. Acts 2, chapter 2, verses 22 to 23. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty words and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourself know, this Jesus delivered up according to the de definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and, and killed by the hands of lawless men. You crucified and killed by the hands of of lawless men. We must also read the report of one more witness, the Apostle John, who was there at the end and spoke to others as well. He wrote, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once came out blood and water. He who saw it was has borne witness. His testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And, God, and again, another scripture says they will look on him who they have pierced. John 19 John chapter 19, verses 34 to 37. It is clear that an injustice has taken place on, the very, on that very dark day, which was recognized and is recognized every year as Good Friday. One may ask what was good about this crime that you call the day Good Friday. It was heinous. To some, it was good to others. The answer should be, it is the acts of the substitute Jesus that he has done for you and I. The Apostle Peter in his sermon draws us to the very core of the substitute's love. Let's go back to Acts 19 verses. 37 to 39. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. I thank God that he is calling us to himself. His promise is for you. His promise is for you. His death is for you. His resurrection is for you. And his substitution, or him being the substitute, is for you. His resurrection is more than a commercial play on words or a label that is placed on a day. Like Peter, I want the truth to cut to your heart today. So let's dive deeper into the acts of the substitute Jesus. The acts of the substitute Jesus was done in love, through love, and for love. He substituted sin for righteousness, bondage for freedom, death for eternal life. As a result, we keep on living and keep on celebrating 
the acts of the substitute Jesus each and every day. He did not stay dead. This heinous crime did not take him under. Instead, our sins were turned to righteousness because he is righteousness. Sin to righteousness. It is the nature of man to downplay what we don't like regardless of if it is true or not. The word sin is on the cancel list due to what it represents. No one wants to see him or herself in the light of being wrong. God's view of sin involves punishment. Punishment. Jesus. For breaking laws given by God or anything that does not promote holiness and righteousness. From the beginning of the Bible, we learn or observe that the wages of sin is death. We find that in Romans chapter 6, verses 23. We may want to minimize our sin or attempt to justify our sinful acts, but, the, but God regards sin as rebellion, punishable by death for the rebel. Therefore, God created a sacrificial system to redeem us from our sin. The sacrificial system requires the shedding of blood for life is in the blood. According to Leviticus chapter 17, verses 14, the blood that was of animal, a bull or a goat, was that sacrificial offering for forgiveness. God assumed the, imag the imagery, God assumed the imagery of blood being shed from a living thing would have pierced the hearts of man and influenced man not to sin. Not so. This is where a substitute was created. Most of us in this room have experienced what it is like to have a substitute teacher. This substitute teacher's job is to continue to teach the work that our regular teacher started. There have been times when the substitute teacher imparts more than the regular teacher. We all know that. The substitute teacher may have more experience in the classroom than the regular teacher. Often, substitute teachers are retired teachers with a vast amount of knowledge. For there is no surprise God sent his only begotten son, full of righteousness in exchange for our sin. The substitute had more experience than us. Now imagine what Jesus was sent to do as a substitute. It is written in Hebrews 10 that it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Then comes uh, then God comes up with another idea to reconcile his people back to him if they fall to sin. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In him we might become right with God. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. The acts of the substitute Jesus in this instance was, replaced, was to replace our sin, our wrong, so that we may have a new and living way in righteousness. He substituted our sin for his righteousness. When we understand the truth of what the resurrection means or what resurrection day means, we rarely will come into the understanding that we became free from the wages of sin and heaviness and bondage that sin can put on us. Bondage to free, for freedom. We often sing a song here at One Worship Place that states, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. The idea of being a slave 
to fear or anything that is not for us, good for us, implies being in bondage. Bondage is defined by lexical as the state of being a slave. Lexical is an online dictionary site powered by Oxford Dictionary. Interestingly, the example used in a sentence was the deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt's bondage. That reference is the first time we encounter the idea of slavery in the Bible. But we must go further back than that. The truth is that our bondage started the day Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. We all know that story. Amen. Bondage is, is associated with Christianity in a negative way. To most people, due to the expectation of God as it relates to how we should feel, think, and behave. These are the areas of life that most of us find ourselves in bondage. For instance, many people in our nation are feeling, thinking, and behaving in a certain way due to COVID restrictions. There are many who feel hijacked. Their thinking is consumed with death, and their behavior is not of one who is sane. How do we break free from this in our feeling, in our thinking, and in our behavior. I want to let you know that Jesus is the bondage breaker. His resurrection substituted our bondage for freedom. When, we, when you or we become a believer, Jesus, the Son of God, set you free, not only from sin, but anything that is holding you bound. The Apostle Paul declared, for in Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set you free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8 and 2, chapter, verses 2. Jesus also said, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. 28 through 30. Jesus always promotes the substitute even in death. He was always promoting him being the substitute even in death. Death for eternal life. Death for eternal life. We have all heard the saying, give me my flowers while I'm still alive. The saying portrays death as being not a beautiful, as beautiful as roses or flowers. We view this death from a worldly view, from being something to fear. Most dictionaries define death as the termination of life, to die or to stop living. If this is our description of death, no wonder we spend so much time trying to work around it. It is evident when the pharmacies and supermarket shelves are filled with products designed to make us look younger, along with the amount of money spent on cosmetic hair dyes and countless other things to prevent aging. Then there is the advancement of medicine and technology, which have increased life expectancy. We all want to live longer because we do not understand the beauty that those who love the Lord experience in death. Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Oh, if Jesus, I want to say that again. Oh, if Jesus thought about death in the same way, we will be lost. He did not fear death, but confronted it on our behalf. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise took of the same thing, that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death, who has the power of death, 
that is the devil. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14. The apostle Paul also speaks of it, a saying which he used in reference to Jesus' resurrection from confronting death. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54 to 56. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. Somebody say thanks be to God who gives us the victory to our Lord Jesus Christ. We got to shout on that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus did not only secure our victory from the defeat of death, but he also by defeat and death, but he also gave us eternal life. He turned our ashes into beauty. We must come into an understanding that there is two aspects to death it, as according to the Bible, a physical and a spiritual one. A physical and a spiritual one. Oh God, hallelujah. Glory to God, hallelujah. Glory to God, hallelujah. It is our spiritual being that will live forever. This is grounds to shout. This is ground to rejoice. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The moment you confess your belief in Jesus Christ, you passed from death to life. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. John chapter 5, verses 24. This profound statement by Jesus means that a believer does not wait for eternal life to begin at death or when Christ returns and is stated in his word. He said, whoever believes comes into eternal life. Eventually, death will be no more, and life will be a forever thing because Jesus turned our ashes into beauty. Jesus substitute our ashes for beauty. In closing, this heinous crime sealed our life forevermore. The acts of the substitute aim to replace sin for righteousness, bondage for freedom, death for eternal life. This Resurrection Sunday, you might be saying, like the men of Israel, after hearing the truth, what shall I do? You should open your heart and receive Jesus. Let righteousness be your path, freedom be your choice, and receive your ticket to eternal life. The substitute Jesus did it all for you and for me. Let us praise him for that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that as those who heard this word today, that we will be like the men of Israel of days past, that our hearts will open, O oh God, to receive our Lord and Savior in. O oh God, that our minds, O oh God, will recognize, in our minds we will recognize that he loves us so and that he can free us from anything that tries to hold us back. I pray, oh God, that someone will be free today. That someone will make a decision today, Lord God, to walk in righteousness. That someone will make the decision today, hallelujah, to accept Jesus and to believe the truth of your word. That eternal life will come to them today. And so, oh God, open up our eyes. 
open up our hearts, open up our understanding that we may come to know what the great substitute has done for us as we celebrate this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We don't want to believe that everyone has a relationship with Christ. But I want to offer you an opportunity to come into that relationship today. I pray that your heart is burning. I pray that you are one of those who want to be free from bondage. I pray that you are one of those who want to be free from sin. I pray that you are one of those who want to one day be with him in glory. The Bible said that he is preparing a place for you, for you, for you, for you, for you and for me. He's preparing that place right now. And I want you to know that he has a spot for you, but it's your choice. The one thing that I will say about God is that he does not force us to do anything we don't want to do because he's a good God. And I also want to say, don't wait to get yourself together. Because we say that all the time. I'm going to get myself together. And when I get myself together, then I'll come. But let Jesus get you together. As you walk with him, he will help you in that way. And so we say a prayer here. And we confess. Our prayer is our confession. It's the prayer of salvation. It's our confession. Do we confess that we believe that Jesus is our Savior and he is our Lord. But before we make that confession, we must. We, I want you to understand what you're confessing. You're confessing, you're at first admitting that you're a sinner, that you've done things wrong in the sight of God, that you've done things wrong that is not pleasing to God, even if it's to others. You're admitting that Jesus Christ is the Savior. He died for your sins. He died for you. And now he's sitting in heaven with the Father waiting for you to join him one day. Then you must believe. Because what we believe, we confess. You must believe that you're forgiven. We heard it today. That Jesus came to forgive. To bring forgiveness into our life. To, to, call, to help us to be forgiven by God. Jesus came to do that. And if that's you today, you need that forgiveness. Jesus has already done it for you. He's already made the substitute. He's already swapped it out. So I want you today to believe in your heart that he's forgiven you. And because of him, you are forgiven of those things that are wrong. And finally, you must confess. I said the prayer of salvation is our confession. We are confessing what we believe about Jesus. We're confessing that he is a savior. We're confessing that he will deliver us. That he has an eternal place for us to be with him one day. So I want you to bow your head and say this prayer with me. Or make this confession with me. Dear Jesus, come into my heart. Take away my sins. Wash me in your blood. Write my name in the book of life. Give me the Holy Spirit. Amen. And if you said that prayer, we need you to call us. We need you to email us. Because we at One Worship Place want to help you to continue to grow in that relationship that you just confessed today. And if you said that prayer, the angels in heaven are rejoicing. And so are we. God bless you and welcome to the family. This is the greatest family that you can ever be a part of.